Hey, welcome back! Today we're going to be talking about Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. Now, humanity has always loved its heroes. We like those stories of big guys who swoop in and save the day, holding fast to true values and virtues, and inspiring us to be better than we are. There are, however, times when it's necessary to challenge our love of those stories. Although romantic belief in a higher ideal can be a wonderful thing, it's also easily coupled with naivety and opens one up to abuse and manipulation. And so in the world of literature, there are also a lot of other stories that cynically devalue heroism or point out the ways in which it unravels and falls apart. Troilus and Cressida is a story retelling the events of the Iliad or the Trojan War. Now, Homer's Iliad has fascinated its audience for centuries. And that story has inspired so many people in artistic representations of heroism. Shakespeare, however, takes the story in a very different direction. This is hands down Shakespeare's most cynical play. It's a love story, but one that disintegrates into disillusionment. It's a story of a war, and it discusses heroics in war, but all of the aspects of heroism within the story quickly disintegrate in the face of backbiting, manipulative jerks. Shakespeare, as always, has layers of ambiguity and nuance to his storytelling, which allows us to approach the story from many different directions. His characters are multifaceted with complex motivations that sometimes they don't even fully recognize, much less the audience. And so it's possible to take interpretation of them in a lot of different directions. But no matter how you interpret these characters, Ultimately, you're still going to come down to the same problem, and that is the undermining of heroism and virtue. Let's start with the prologue. A lot of Shakespeare's plays have prologues that call us into the story, where Shakespeare speaks directly to his audience, or has a character speak directly to the audience. And in each of those, Shakespeare humbly asks favor of the audience. This is the only exception. Instead of humbly asking the generosity of the audience, the prologue ends, And hither am I come, a prologue armed, but not in confidence of author's pen or actor's voice, but suited in like conditions as our argument, to tell you, fair beholders, that our play leaps o'er the vaunt, and firstlings of these broils, beginning in the middle, starting thence away to what may be digested in a play. Like, or find fault, do as your pleasures are, now, good or bad, tis but the chance of war. Whether you like it or not doesn't ultimately matter that much to me. Here it is, take it or leave it. That's a completely different tone from any other Shakespeare prologue. In like conditions as our argument. So just like the argument is not going to hold faith, the play itself is not above insulting its audience. If you think that's bad, wait till you get to the epilogue. Now, most Shakespearean epilogues are this very humble plea for applause at the end of the play. At the end of this one, we have the character Pandarus, who is a pimp. In fact, his name becomes synonymous with pimps. And just as Troilus is making his final statement, which sounds like a poetic close to the play, Pandarus rushes on the stage and tries to talk to him. Troilus shoves Pandarus away, and then Pandarus turns to the audience and gives an epilogue. In the epilogue, he more or less says, ain't that just the way? And then he turns to the audience and says, Hey, O oh, traitors and bods, how earnestly are you set at work, and how ill-requited! Why should our endeavor be so loved, and the performance so loathed? He turns to the audience for empathy, making this connection to them as other traitors in the flesh. In other words, he calls the audience pimps as well, and asks for you to weep for his plight. And if you don't, he says he will leave you the pox. The same sort of disease you might get in a house of prostitution. Talk about undermining the heroism here, the tone is incredibly shocking. Within the play itself, we have two stories unfolding. We have the love story of Troilus and Cressida, and we have the story of the Trojan War. And it mirrors the events of the Iliad. Achilles is sitting out, he doesn't want to fight, ultimately Patrocles goes out in his place and gets killed, and then Achilles finally goes out and challenges Hector. The two of them fight, Achilles wins, and then Achilles drags Hector's body. Those are the same events as in the Iliad, but the tone of those events is completely different. First of all, let's talk about the love story itself. Troilus is madly in love with Cressida, and he just really wants Cressida. Cressida loves him too, but she's been putting him off all of this time. 
Pandarus is going between them and he's trying to get his niece, Cressida, to sleep with Troilus, because that's what Troilus wants. Ultimately, Troilus and Cressida have this moment where they come together and they swear these deep promises to each other. And then, they have their tryst. Afterwards, Cressida is taken by the Trojans and exchanged for a captive in the Greek camp. And so Troilus and Cressida have to be separated. Troilus takes this remarkably well. I mean, he's bummed, but he accepts it immediately. Cressida, on the other hand, tries everything she can to refuse. No, I have to be with Troilus. No, I don't care that my dad is in the Greek camp. No, I won't leave. But she has no say in it. She's forced to. Troilus, then, makes her promise to always be faithful. She's already sworn it before their tryst, and now he makes her again swear over and over again that she will always be faithful to him. And yet, he gives her absolutely no security, no safety, no freedom. She's being traded off by Troilus' own family, and she has no way to take care of herself in the Greek camp. And yet Troilus expects her to always be his perfect image of what he wants. When he won't even do anything for her. Once she gets to the Greek camp, it's very clear that the Greeks think that they can do anything with her. Cressida's powerlessness is really emphasized when she first enters the Greek camp and Agamemnon, the general, kisses her and then tells all of his commanders to kiss her in general. And so they walk up and each want a kiss from her. When Menelaus tries to get a kiss, she manages to put a stop to it. After all, he's the one who lost Helen. And she uses her wit both to put him and then afterwards Ulysses down. Her refusal only leads Ulysses to more or less call her a strumpet. And so she gives herself to Diomedes, one of the Greek generals. Why does she do that? It's very complicated. In fact, it's talked about as one of the most complicated scenes in Shakespeare. Part of the complexity is, again, in the fact that Cressida herself doesn't even fully understand her motivations. We see her speaking with Diomedes, but her lover Troilus, who's also in the Greek camp at that time, is watching her from a hiding place, along with Ulysses. And they are being watched, in turn, by another character, Thersides, who is the absolute deepest cynic. And every single character has a different perspective on what's going on. And so for us as an audience, who's watching someone, watching someone, watching someone... Earlier in the play, when talking about Troilus, she also said that the only power women have is to increase their allure by refusing for a while. Which is why, even though she loves him, she puts him off for a while. She says, Yet I hold off. Women are angels wooing. Things won are done. Joy's soul lies in the doing. That she beloved knows not, but knows not this. Men prize the thing ungained more than it is. That she was never yet, that ever knew, love got so sweet as when desire did sue. Therefore this maxim out of love I teach, achievement is command, ungained beseech. Then, though my heart's content firm love doth bear, nothing of that shall from mine eyes appear. The only power she has is to hold off and make Troilus want her more. In fact, after she does give herself to Troilus, that's when he lets go of her and lets her be taken by the Greeks all while still expecting her faithfulness. The other story unfolding is the story of the Trojan War. And there we see a whole lot of shallow machissimo, as Ajax and Achilles both strut around basically flexing and showing off. Ulysses, meanwhile, is trying to manipulate everybody, using his quick tongue to try to get what he wants out of the situation. In fact, Ulysses claims at the beginning of the play that we really should have a better hierarchy here. Our power structure is all a mess. Everybody is interested in their own gains and showing off. But then instead of trying to make things more structured, he uses their showing off to manipulate them. The wisdom that he expresses early on is never shown in his actions. The only character in this play who has any decency is clearly Hector. Hector has virtue through and through. Maybe too much of it. This whole war is over Helen, who is completely worthless, we discover in this play. She has nothing desirable except her looks, and pretty quickly everyone grows tired of her, except for Paris. She's not worth the heavy death toll on either side. Both Hector says so, as well as Diomedes. The Trojans and the Greeks. But Hector still believes in fighting for something noble. And although this isn't actually noble because they stole her in the first place, He's going to keep doing it just out of the show of chivalry. He also shows chivalry every time he's fighting anyone. 
Anyone he's fighting, he gives them a chance to catch their breath if they get tired. He never takes advantage of other people. And by extension, he believes that's how other people should act towards him as well. Which ultimately leads to his downfall. Because every other character in this play is lustful, manipulative, cowardly, brutish. Ultimately showing that humanity is full of ugliness. That takes advantage of the good whenever possible. So let's do a quick walk through the action of this play. The play opens with Troilus speaking with Pandarus, the uncle of Cressida, and he's telling about his great love for Cressida, and he's asking when Pandarus is gonna get Cressida for him. And Pandarus keeps putting him off. Pandarus is kind of a foolish, talkative old man. And he's obviously clearly trying to manipulate his niece into a relationship with Troilus for his own gain. We also see that Troilus has not been fighting. He's been too busy thinking about love lately. There are a lot of characters throughout this play who put off fighting. Troilus puts it off sometimes for Cressida. Achilles is putting it off for a woman. Thersites is putting it off just because he's a coward. In scene two, Pandarus tries to talk Cressida into falling in love with Troilus, but she keeps using her quick wit to talk around him. Although when he leaves, she does, as we mentioned before, admit that she does love him. She's just afraid of surrendering what power she has over to him. In scene three, we cut over to the Greek camp, and this is where the widespread vision of the war really begins. And we see Ulysses talking about the need for a better power structure in the Greek camp, how they're being beaten because they aren't united and organized very well, and also because Achilles is sitting out being a big wimp. He promised a woman of Troy that he wouldn't fight, and so he's sitting out for a woman's sake. Also in the scene, Aeneas comes into the Greek camp, he's a Trojan of course, and gives a challenge from Hector, that Hector will have a one-on-one -on -one battle with one of their choosing. Of course the obvious choice is Achilles, but they decide maybe it'd be better if we put the choice on Ajax instead, because Ajax is also a prideful macho muscle man, and if we gave Ajax glory, maybe that would make Achilles get upset and jealous and then step up and actually do his job. In Act 2, we get to meet some of these characters more up close. Scene 1, we meet Ajax, who, again, he's just a big muscly buffoon. We also meet Thersites, who I've mentioned a few times as this incredible cynic. He's a clown character, but he is definitely the most bitter and dark clown of all of Shakespeare. His mockery of every character in this play just shows his fascination with human depravity. We also meet Patrocles and Achilles, and Achilles and Ajax are of course jealous of each other's glory and trying, both trying to show off. Patrocles has been Achilles' side entertainment while he's been in his vacation. Meanwhile, back in the Trojan camp, they're all talking about the glories of war, and basically how this war is not that glorious. What are we fighting for anyway, Helen? And this is the point at which Hector shows how Helen really isn't worth it, but he's still going to fight for the glory of the thing. Well, in the Greek camp, we continue our tension between Ajax and Achilles as all of the Greeks begin to put more glories on Ajax and pit him against Hector as opposed to Achilles. Of course, the center of Act 3 is the center of the play, where Troilus and Cressida finally meet up and they confess their love to each other. And they make these big, memorable promises that sound very ceremonial. Troilus swears that from now on, everyone who promises faithfulness will always promise on his own name because he's going to become an icon for faithfulness. And Cressida, in response, makes the same promise, saying, I will be always faithful to you, and if I ever break it people throughout time and history will use my name as a symbol for unfaithfulness. She's trying this deep, moving love story, but she's giving herself to him something that she's afraid of, and we can clearly see how afraid she is of this. Of course, it doesn't pay off, as we will see very soon. Because back in the Greek camp, the one time we see Cressida's father, he is a Trojan who's decided to work for the Greeks, and he's been helping them out, and he says, for a favor, will you bring my daughter over here? Well, that's nice, but he never cares about her or shows up again. He just leaves her in the hands of all these really lecherous Greeks who all want to make out with her. Ulysses is also using quick speech to try to work Achilles up and make Achilles really jealous of Ajax. And it seems like it's working for a moment, but it's really just going to fizzle out. Act 4 begins with Diomedes showing up in Troy to do the prisoner exchange and take Cressida back. Troilus and Cressida have had their one night together, and as the morning breaks, they're interrupted with the news that Cressida is being taken off and exchanged with the Greeks. And Troilus's response is, oh, oh no, but I guess it has to happen. Whereas Cressida is completely destroyed by this. 
and she's fighting against it with all she has. She says she'll give up her father, she'll give up everything if she can hold on to Troilus and hold on to her place here in Troy. Troilus goes off to speak with Paris and realizes it just has to happen. And so he comes back to say goodbye to Cressida, emphasizing over and over again that she be true, even though she feels helpless and horrified. Again, that same helplessness that she's reflected all the way before. Her power to hold on to and control her situation is so limited and so small. And yet he asks her to continue to control the situation for his sake, in spite of the fact that he's doing nothing to help her. She leaves clearly distressed to arrive at the Greek camp in the scene that I've already talked about where everybody tries to kiss her, emphasizing again her helplessness. After she leaves the stage, in comes Hector to have his friendly bout with Ajax, and the two of them fight. But Hector is, of course, showing all kinds of mercy. After all, Ajax is distantly related to him. And they decide to all celebrate the great Hector now that he's in their camp and have a party with him. Although through all of their language, it's very clear that Hector is the one showing virtue and nobility. And the rest of them are like, man, I totally kicked you while you're down if I have the chance. Troilus is also with Hector, and he's really gloomy because Cressida is gone. And so he buddies up with Ulysses and asks if he can see where Cressida's living. In Act 5, we have a scene where Thoricides mocks Patrocles and Achilles as he mocks everyone. And as the party's been going on between the Greeks and the Trojans, they all start separating and going different direction. Diomedes, of course, is going over to check out Cressida. Troilus and Ulysses follow behind him from a safe distance. And Thersites, who wants to see the mess, decides to follow as well. This leads to the scene I mentioned before where Troilus and Ulysses are overhearing Cressida talk with Diomedes. And we see Cressida go through this series of reversals over and over again. Diomedes is just kind of standing there, he wants Cressida, but he's also just kind of ready to blow off everything. Cressida feels this sort of conflict, she keeps changing her mind about everything. It's clear that everything she's doing is filled with worry and self-doubt. She's kind of flirting with him, and she's kind of promising things to him, and she's also taking them back. But Troilus, of course, only sees the unfaithfulness here, and he begins to curse all of womanhood. Similar to the way Hamlet curses all of women when he sees the way his mother quickly remarries after his father's death. Ulysses is like, you can't generalize like that! And Thersites is standing back there laughing at everything and talking about how it's such a great vision of all of the lewdness and debauchery and lechery of humanity. People are horrible. <laughs> the scene ends when Aeneas comes up to find Troilus and be like, Hey, everybody's leaving already. Come on, it's time to go. And so they all head back to Troy. The next morning, Hector's getting ready for a battle when his wife Andromache and his sister Cassandra and his father Priam, they all are telling him, No, don't go to war today. Everybody had bad dreams about you. You can't go. Please don't go. And Hector's like, No, it's noble to fight. I've got to do it. And they're all like, no, we know that you'll die if you go out there, and you're the only hope for Troy, so don't just throw yourself away on some vision of nobility, please. But no, nobility is everything to Hector, and so he goes anyway. The hero. Troilus is also going, but that's because he is super angry and cold towards life now. Everything he believed in has been shattered, and he just wants to kill people. Pandarus runs up with a love letter from Cressida, and he rips it up and throws it away. The next several scenes highlight a whole bunch of fighting going on. There's this huge war sequence. And we see all these different characters doing different things. Thersity keeps avoiding fighting and showing what a coward he is, while still mocking human depravity. Patrocles is killed offstage, and of course that riles Achilles into finally acting. Achilles goes out to hunt out Hector. Hector and Achilles have a big face-off, and it's this big fight scene, but neither one wins. Because Achilles is out of shape. He's not been fighting in a while, and he's winded. And so Hector, instead of taking advantage of that opportunity, steps back and says, Why don't you catch your breath a while? I don't want to take advantage of you! And so Achilles is like, yep, see ya. And Hector goes off after a knight in this fancy, shiny armor that he wants. Meanwhile, Achilles goes back and gets all of his Myrmidons and gets this big gang together, and they go out to find Hector again. They do find Hector, and he's just taken off his armor and put his sword down, because he's going to put on this new armor. And he says, oh, wait just a second, let me get ready first. And Achilles is like, nuh-uh, kill him, boys! And so this big group of Myrmidons jumps on the defenseless Hector and slaughters him. 
in absolute contrast to Hector's nobility. And then Achilles says, spread the word that Achilles beat Hector. He didn't beat Hector. They didn't even fight Hector right there. He had his boys slaughter a defenseless man. But the news of Hector's death and the news that Achilles beat Hector spreads throughout both armies. The Greeks are elated, of course, and the Trojans are devastated because Hector was their last hope. And with his fall, they know that the city will ultimately fall. Also, they still have some hope in revenge. It's a pretty shallow hope. And the play closes, as I mentioned before, with the epilogue of a pimp. It's a dark, sad, cynical play. In some ways, a counterpoint to the passionate, poetic love of Romeo and Juliet, or the brave heroism and goodness of Henry V, and showing that sometimes the worst aspects of humanity win the day and beat out our heroes. Thanks for watching. You can click to watch another Shakespeare play, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.